Well, we'll go ahead and open up our workshop. It's May 31st, and we're just glad to have everyone from NDC here. It's going to be an exciting day. This time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Prince. Okay. Uh, first, we're going to do uh, the pledge and the uh, treasure hunters. All right, good morning. Uh, we got a little rain this morning, and hopefully that's not going to put a crimp. Uh, it's supposed to clear out a little bit uh, because we do have a bus tour, um, pretty ex extensive bus tour. Terrence is going to get up, Mr. O'Leary, our chief operating officer, and kind of go through uh, the day of what it's going to look like this morning. Uh, and it's really about the developers. I want to thank the Economic Development Council, and I'll be getting into some things later today with uh, what does the future look like in St. Lucie County. And I want to th uh, thank the Economic Development Council for being here today and also IRSC because these are our partners in everything that we do with regards to um, the development of St. Lucie County because people uh, choose where they live based on the quality of the schools. I mean, that's, that's really what it's all about. And as you have economic development, the, uh, the quality of our schools over the past seven or eight years have dramatically improved. And I think that we've been incredibly responsive with regards to what our local community needs with regards to workforce development, uh, what programs we have in our schools that prepare students for the world of work or college. And that is really done through um, the Economic Development Council and also them advising us on what uh, the workers or the employers are going to need moving forward and what do we have to graduate kids ready for. So they're part of this today as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add is we're going to go and meet some of our home developers. Uh, our home developers have come and reached out to us with regards to the public schools because as they're building homes, we have to meet the needs of all the families that are moving into our area. And you'll get a sense of the scope of that over the next few years and what's happening now through that bus tour. Before I get there, though, I just wanted to say thank you uh, with regards to our graduation ceremonies. Tomorrow is the last day for students, and it's, it's really been a special year. We had, uh, we had a couple of hiccups in our graduation ceremonies. We had rain in one, and we had the power go out in another one. <laughs> but I, I just can't tell you enough that the staff that puts all of those things together, they truly put a lot of work uh, and effort into that, as seen by uh, Steve and Doug. Uh, those are the guys that are manning the cameras, and that was actually during the Port St. Lucie High School graduation. And it really takes a team to put those graduation ceremonies together. So I wanted to thank our staff and I also think, wanted to thank the board members for being at those graduation ceremonies because it does mean something to the students. Uh, although commencement is the conclusion of a child's life in school and that graduation, we do have a lot of graduation ceremonies for kindergartners, uh, moving up ceremonies for fifth grade, uh, eighth grade graduations that I was at my daughter's yesterday. She's uh, finished up uh, her education at the uh, K-8 school, and I had the opportunity to be a guest speaker yesterday at her graduation. But just to be part of a family's and many, many families' lives as we celebrate the end of the school year, it really makes me feel good whenever I go into the schools and I'm part of these ceremonies. Yesterday, we had a, a mini catastrophe that was averted. Uh, we had a power outage at, K at uh, St. Lucie West K-8, and they had a kindergarten ceremony that had to be moved to Centennial High. And I just wanted to thank Centennial for immediately stepping up and providing that option for those families so the families did, weren't uh, weren't disrupted in any way. They just went right next door to Centennial, so that was great. So without further ado, uh, Mr. O'Leary is going to get up, and he's going to outline what is in your folders and also kind of outline what, uh, what you're going to see over the next couple of hours as we take this tour of our community and see the development that is occurring. Mr. O'Leary? Yes. 
Good morning, uh, Chairman Ingersoll, board members, guests, our superintendent, Dr. Prince. Um, today I'm excited that we are going to, sometimes when we learn that you have visual learners and hands-on learners, so today we're gonna take that approach of allowing the visual learners and hands-on learners to get on a bus and go see everything that's going on in tradition. And I know Dr. Wild enjoys a good shopping trip out to tradition, but today the tradition that we're going to look at are where all the homes are going, Western Grove, uh, where our new high school is, is beginning to be built. And I'm gonna show you some images. I wanted to start with a quick construction update. As you can see, this is Tradition Triple D. You can see the site work has been completed. Well, this will be the last stop on our tour. Uh, the construction offices have been situated and we'll be able to go visit that today. Obviously, I wanted also to tell you that on June 13th, many of you are gonna be getting invitations. They're going out. That will be the groundbreaking for Tradition D. Uh, we are on time, everything within our schedule is still on time for Tradition Triple D to open in August of 2025. I also wanted to give you an update, quick update on Fort Pierce Westwood. Here's our rendition. We've been doing a tremendous amount of work. I wanted you to notice where the location, we have moved that to the front of the road right outside of Angle, so it's very well, uh, you're able to see that as you're driving through. It's no longer hidden, we have it Right at the front, we also have multiple entrances. Instead of just Panther Lane, there's on the north side, you'll see the bus loop area, and then the grand entrance coming into the front. Uh, just last Friday, we have met with all the CTE program teachers, going through their programs to make sure we're meeting the needs of their programs, everything from our ag culture, agricultural, uh, to our uh, robotics, farm tech, all of those types of things. Here's just another uh, rendi rendering of their site. And the most important thing is that we'll begin that work here in June, as soon as the kids let out. After their half day, we need to temporarily uh, construct uh, facilities for our OTC program and our agricultural uh, programs. We'll be relocating them back towards the school so that they can be ready for the opening of school while we then go ahead and clear that lot. So lots of things happening on both sites, we are on time for the openings that we have discussed with you. So the timelines remain intact and our work has begun. So I just wanted to do a quick update uh, for our guests and everyone else as we're moving forward. So with that today, in your folders, we have given you a copy of the actual presentation as well as the agenda. Um, I wanted you to be able to, as we're driving, we'll narrate um, and highlight some of the areas as we drive along. I'm not gonna do that for the entire, although you might be very tired of that after the first 15 minutes of my voice, so I wanna make just highlight just the specific areas as we're driving through. Our first stop is we are gonna meet with the master developers. We wanna hear, they've been coming uh, to Marty and I and it's weekly meetings with them um, asking us, where, what are we doing for the public schools? We're putting houses here, we're selling to parents. The first questions they get are where are the schools located? What's the public schools bringing into the area? So these have been ongoing conversations as these developments have been moving forth. I also know the mayor had did a town hall meeting about, about two months ago with similar questions from the individuals that attended the um, town hall. Also very similar infrastructure, where the roads, those types of things coming through. She did a phenomenal job um, and we wanna make sure that we're aligned to their work so our, our work can coincide and meet the uh, demand of all the um, community members coming into play. So after our first stop there, we're gonna go to Verano, the clubhouse. We're gonna meet John Sapo there and Scott Morton. Uh, they're gonna talk a lot about the growth in the area. They were some of the first two individuals that started with the old PGA, where they started building. And now they're coming out to Verano. They're gonna show uh, some of their Eastern Verano and then also their plans with something that just popped up, which is called Oak Ridge. Just didn't pop up because it's about 8,500 
uh, single family homes uh, out there off of Glades Cutoff as well. After that stop, we're going to tour uh, some of the Tradition Parkway, specifically the Western Grove, so that we'll go out, look at new um, single family homes, multi uh, multi-family homes out towards Cadence, Seville, uh, the new regional park, and also where our K-8 uh, new school will be um, out there. Right now it's slated for 2027, as you recall, uh, from our board meetings. Lastly, we'll head down Village. We'll go to, towards uh, Becker Road. So going through Southern Grove, we'll be able to point out not just all the building of some age-restricted homes, but all of the multifamily apartment buildings that are, being, uh, that are going up. And we'll point that out as we drive um, going down there so you're able to see uh, right off of Village all the different home sites um, that are being um, developed. And our last stop, we'll loop around 95. We're going to come back, and we're going to come out the back side of um, Commerce, right back out here. And we're going to stop in and meet with Wilder. That is the Greenpoint uh, group, master planners. They're doing the 4,000 homes right across the street of Commerce. Um, both They have multiple developer uh, builders in there, Lennar and Meritage. Uh, and you'll... We are going to loop through because yesterday when we did another test drive, there are construction trucks everywhere, um, just building both sides real quick. They are also doing all the work. That is Austin Burr, where we'll be meeting with. They're doing lots of work if you go down on the Becker, south side of Becker, past Publix, both sides. Uh, they have age restricted, but they also have single family homes and multifamily homes all the way down to Map Road. And then our last stop, if the rain challenges hold off, uh, we'll be going out to, to the uh, actual Tradition Triple D site. And we're going to take the back way through, because uh, Crosstown's not just yet, so we'll go down, Glades cut off. We're going to stop, make a transition. Mitch, your favorite bus driver, is there waiting for us. Uh, we'll switch onto that bus so we can go in and you can see the site of where Tradition D is and the amount of work uh, on there. That's our agenda for today. The good news is, yes, it rained. It looks like the rain has stopped, and the bus has showed up, so it is out front waiting for us. But I just wanted to go through a couple more uh, quick slides for you to visually see it. I just outlined that. Hard to see, but, you know, our first stop will be Verano. Second stop, we're going to go tour the Western Grove, Mattamy, uh, all of their development out there. Our third stop will be Wild, Wilder out on Glades Cutoff, and then our last stop will be at Tradition uh, Triple D. So here's the area we're talking about in Tradition. Uh, currently, you'll notice that approved 33,500 um, family homes that are out there. Right now, about 30% of that's built. Now, what I don't, this changes every day. You know, something pops up, a new development, these numbers are changing every day, and it looks like remaining to be built still about 70% of those dwelling units out there, homes. What I don't see on here when I highlighted this area is currently there is no St. Lucie Public School in that area. We have three other schools there. We have the Tradition Prep High School. We have the Renaissance Charter School. We also have our Palm Point um, FAU Lab School, but currently we do not have um, a St. Lucie Public School in there. Doc, you were good? No, and I think that that's the important point to make for later uh, because uh, we don't have a footprint in the Tradition Corridor. Uh, like Terrence said, there, there's a couple of charters and uh, the FAU Charter School, but when it comes to community students, we do not have uh, a public community school there. Um, that's available for students. And we're going to re revisit that later uh, when we get back. I'm going to talk about that. So thank you, Terrence. With that said, uh, the new Tradition High School, just for our other guests, we're looking to open that in August 2025. We will be on time. Thank you very much. Fort Pierce Westwood Academy opening in January of 2026. There is some float in that schedule. We are working really hard to make up that float. Um, I'm working with Derek and team to see if we could 
open that in August. So we, we are working along that, but right now on our calendar, it's opening in January of 2026. I would love to open it for that August, the same time frame, so uh, be easier transition. And then lastly, you see the K-8 Tradition School opening in August of 2027. Um, right now, we are looking at the Western Grove. We'll point that out to you because of the amount of single family homes and multifamily homes in that concentrate, similar to what we were doing for tr uh, Tradition Triple D. Um, as you go south, we do have other K-8 uh, um, places, two K-8 models that we can look at, but there's a lot of age restricted still around those, uh, those sites, and we'll be able to show it to you. So to orient you, this is Tradition. You see on top, that's Crosstown. Towards the middle is the Tradition Parkway, if you're familiar with out there. It's about 95% built. It's about 6,300 dwelling units that are there. Our high school is just to the north, if you will, of Crosstown Parkway. Um, that Crosstown Parkway will be ready for 2025 when we extend it out to our high school. When we look at this, this is Western Grove. It's about 25% built. That's about 4,000 dwelling units or homes, if you will. Um, we will take you on that ride on Tradition Parkway all the way to the new um, developments of uh, Candace and Seville. We'll also point out a regional park uh, there that will align with the work that we do at the city about sharing that, and I'll show you that in a second. And also that's where we're looking to put uh, that new K-8 um, to help um, bring our community uh, students to that area. With that said, here are the school locations. That's tradition right above it, what I was just discussing. And right here is Western um, Grove, and that's where the K-8 is. What we wanted to show you, make sure I get this together. 2023, Madam Me is looking for and working with the city on a regional park in that area. You can see the massive size of that park. You'll notice to the left there, that is where our um, K-8 would be. So joint sharing use of those facilities for our students um, is a huge impact for us uh, going forward. We obviously, you've seen plans with traditional uh, Triple D. To the left of that, we also have a park um, that will be available and we could share resources. Very similar to Centennial, when you look at Centennial and then to the park that's right next to it. So we try to do a lot of work with the city on making sure we're leveraging those assets. Then we'll travel south down Village uh, Parkway. We'll be able to show you Village Parkway is about 55% built and then just over about 7,600 homes uh, in that area. We'll head all the way down to Becker. We'll go into Becker so you can see all the new developments going in Becker. We'll loop around. They have Bel Belterra, um, which is just being built at this point. Uh, point. That's GHO homes that are building in that area. Um, and if you haven't been down there in a long time, this is the visual hands-on, how quickly things are transpiring and growth is being built. Again, coming down Village, we'll point out to you on the trip where the K-8 is, uh, right off there on Village Parkway, and then there's one also in the Becker Road area. The one, what I also wanted to talk about were the roads uh, coming in, because there's a lot of concerns about roads coming in. So the first one I'm going to be discussing is where Tradition Triple D is, the extension of Crosstown Parkway that will go all out to Range Line Road. That will be completed by 2025. You can see the work around Western uh, Grove there. That's where the K-8 will be. That also will be in 2027 punched all the way through. By the time we are looking to put our K-8 in there, we will have the road extended to where it is. They're also looking at a fire station there right next to our facility as well. So bringing in all the services to the community. Discovery Way and Marshall Parkway, again, will punch all the way through to Range Line Road. That's for future development. Uh, and then Becker Road also punching all the way through to Range Line uh, tw in 2025. Now these are all plans and obviously we work through those plans um, with our developers, make sure that they're ready, uh, you know, for our schools, our buses, and those types of things as we go through. We hope for you to hear that today. Lastly, I wanted to show you the actual Triple D site. You know, from our old board meetings, as we did our workshops, this was taken in September 11th, 2022. That's Central Park. 
Uh, the roads there are Village and Crosstown, and it stops, you gotta make that left. Well, if we take a look at that now, these are all multifamily homes. That is Alton Apartments, uh, three stories high, 318 um, units. To the south there, that's Havana's. That's one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom houses. When we drive out, we'll point that out to you. But these are where we will be getting our children from. Those are um, areas where we're gonna be getting a lot of our students. We'll take you through this area um, all the way. You'll see some uh, vertical. So when I say vertical construction, the water pipes and all of the work that goes on the earthwork, but then you will see this type of horizontal construction, meaning it's already going up and quickly because we, between Marty and I driving out in our routes for the last three, it changes every day that we're out there. And then I just wanted to bring up triple uh, tradition, triple D. Uh, I know it was asked in one of our last board meetings about the programs that will be there. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that later, but um, Dr. Wild will. But it's very medical themed. It's a good fit for that school with Cleveland Clinic out there, with all the medical themed programs, dental, biomedical, occupational physical therapy, exercise science, and allied um, LPN uh, types of programs. In addition to that, we have hospitality, Another big one, and that's why we asked the EDC, because we had sat with them to go through some of the presentation with them, is global logistics. So with FedEx, Cheney Brothers, with Amazon right there, what a great opportunity for our students for internships to transfer what they're learning in the classroom, I'm a hands-on learner, and in, right into the work that they may be um, looking to do. So global logistics, and then of course, advanced course offerings, dual enrollment, Cambridge, and advanced placement. And again, we were talking about that, and when I first did this presentation for the EDC, I had to change wording, and it's probably, maybe needs to change again, but I wanted to highlight Legacy Park, because that's the Amazon, FedEx, and Cheney Brothers. Uh, we'll be passing that on our left as we go, so we'll be pointing that out uh, for you, but massive facilities and job opportunities for, for our students. Uh, again, coming down Village, I wanted to show you, there is the, the one of the K-8 properties that we have. Uh, right next to it, Madame has a Stars and Stripes Park. Uh, so again, trying to put space right, um, usable space right next to our facilities. Uh, the Stars and Stripes are for firefighters, policemen, our first responders, those types of um, individuals. Then as we get all the way to Becker, uh, you'll see these developments. We have another K-8 down there. You have Kenley going in with a lot of single family uh, homes, uh, different lot sizes, so that you can see that. That's on your papers uh, that you're able to see. We'll loop back around, uh, talk about Glades cutoff projects, because these are just expanding tremendously. So uh, Wilder, a couple months back, you saw the entrance. Well, now you're actually gonna go see all the horizontal construction. So all the homes that are going up by Lennar and um, Meritage on the left as we go in there, that's 4,000 dwelling units. We're gonna speak to Austin Burr there. We'll uh, do, probably have to do a three-point term because there's so many construction trucks. Uh, we're not even gonna be able to get all the way through all of it, but you, you'll be able to see it as we go further. And Mr. O'Leary, that's over by Alapata Flats. That is in between yep. those two. Alapata Flats is right in the middle. Okay, thank you. Um, right there, you can see that little space there and Copper Creek and all of those developments as well, those existing developments. So um, to the south there, that is Oak Ridge Ranch. That's about 3,800 acres and about 8,500 um, homes slated for that. So if you just come to the right a little bit, that's where Tradition Triple D is. So, you know, as we were looking for spots, this became after we had picked that spot. So huge amount of de development coming in here for that, um, for that area. So with that said, I was gonna take questions, but our bus driver is ready for us. Now I do wanna talk, if you need an umbrella, I brought extra umbrellas, I have three extra umbrellas. Um, Marty and I will be talking with the bus driver to take us through. We will have water and snacks uh, available to you as you're going through. So um, Judy, my um, admin, will be walking up and down the bus if you need a little snack coming back. Once we come back, 
There'll be snacks available for you here before we start up and go through the uh, presentation with some of the concepts that we have for you to, to allow us to explore too. Okay, Dr. Prince. Just looking at my radar, <laughs> it, looks, it looks okay right now. I feel like it was last yes. week. We were saying yes. that to yes. each other quite a bit. So, so right now, the Dr. Prince forecasting looks pretty good. So we shall see. Hopefully this is, this is, uh, this is not a, a wet mess. So we'll, we'll find out. So Terrence, I'm going to let you lead the charge. Sure. Um, we're going to load up the bus on the... It's right out front. We okay. have the bus loaded right up out front. Okay. So you're welcome to go ahead and, and bring your folder if you would like. Um, but Marty and I will be narrating as we go. So it's up to you uh, from that. All righty, we're going to go ahead and start. We just had a, a, a nice trip around St. Lucie County, particularly in uh, Port St. Lucie, just to see the growth and the capacity of all the homes coming in. Thank you, Dr. Prince. Thank you, Terrence O'Leary. Thank you, Marty Sanders and everyone that was involved, communications, um, CTE programs, and everything else. Alicia, thank you. So uh, Student Services, Michelle Jorger was there. Thank you. And um, uh, we just had a a great trip and Dr. Prince we're going to turn it back over to you. Okay uh, thank you Mr. Ingersoll. Just a couple of things. It really put things into perspective with the amount of growth. It's one thing to hear about things but it's another to kind of see it. To see the scope all the way from Becker Road all the way to Glades Cutoff and also to see the size of the, um, the high school site because that'll be unrecognizable in a year from now uh, once we break ground on that. So uh, what we're going to talk about now is just uh, getting consensus from the board uh, of, of some things that I would like to plan or do with regards to uh, dealing with the growth that we're going to have. Uh, we have some issues with some um, schools that we need to put more students in on the north side of the county, and we also have to address the, the un, you know, unwieldy development that we're having in the southwest part of our county. So Dr. Wild is going to now I'm going to turn it over to her to address kind of the second half of the program with kind of looking at the future and what you know we or what I would recommend to the board uh, moving forward. Dr. Wild. Good morning. Good morning everyone. Chairman Ingersoll, board members, Superintendent Prince. Yes, we just had that great bus tour and had an opportunity to see the tremendous growth and we've been taking a look at the capacity of all of our schools and the enrollment and brainstorming some strategies and today we're sharing some recommendations for the future with you. First, talking about North County, um, sometimes referred to as the Green Zone, we are aware that some of our Green Zone schools or Fort Pierce schools are under enrolled and we're, we're going to talk about two of them specifically today. Um, because the green zone population is not as dense as the southern part of the county, um, the, there's slower growth. There is growth and development happening in Fort Pierce, uh, but it is not at the same rapid rate as we're seeing in um, South County. Um, in addition, there are no non-magnet K-8 options in Fort Pierce. Um, so we're aware of that. There are several in South County. Green Zone students also, and, and this was talked about a little bit on the bus today, um, are bused to Allapattah Flats K-8 as well. As you recall, that school was out there without development around it for quite some time, and so it serves as both a red zone serving Port St. Lucie students and a Green Zone school currently. Our recommendations for the Green Zone or for Fort Pierce include reutilizing this building space of C.A. Moore and Francis K. Sweet. And specifically, we're gonna talk about a recommendation to turn C.A. Moore into a K-8 school and to provide a preschool for the community in F.K. Sweet. We're also looking at student addresses of all of the students and inviting parents to switch schools and go to a school closer to their home if they would like, looking to reduce the east-west transportation pathways um, in North County. 
And also, we would like to transition Allapattah Flats back to a full red zone school, which was the original intent, and thereby moving Fort Pierce students back into the schools that are closer to their homes. So expanding on the details of Chester A. Moore Elementary School, currently it serves 396 students with a capacity for 805. So reorganizing that school to a KA, and many of you were with us when we've done that with other schools in St. Lucie County, um, it does provide families with continuity. So if they have multiple children, they can keep their kids together longer, and there's a lot of benefits in the home with that, with parents working after school and so forth. So we believe this may be a strategy to attract more families to CA more and also fill the classrooms. It does also add another uh, middle school option for Fort Pierce families. Currently, they have Dan McCarty in Forest Grove. If we were to move forward with this concept, it would also give us an opportunity to bring more exciting curriculum into CA Moore, which could serve the students in K through eight. Looking at some advanced curriculum in terms of early college preparation, like AP, Cambridge, or AVID, um, more career technical, skilled trades or mechanical, skilled trades or CTE programs that would lead to immediate employment after the children complete one of our high school pathways. The process would include developing these curriculum ideas with the stakeholders as well as the principal. I have spoken to Mrs. Jackson about this plan. She's really excited about the possibilities that it might bring. This is a potential phase-in plan for the school that would eventually, by 2027, add 225 middle school students to the school. And, and you can see it's a phased-in plan, starting with two fifth grade classes and then expanding all the way up till we have sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teams, and eventually leading to 225 students in the school. That would bring it closer to capacity and also allow for growth while they're attracting more families to the school. For Francis K. Sweet, you, you can see here they have 353 students currently with a capacity for 777. So there's a lot of room to fill those seats. And we have been exploring the possibility of a partnership with the Bezos organization. They have Bezos academies across the country now that are Montessori preschools. Um, specifically, they are free for families, year-round Montessori preschool experiences. It, this would be a community service as well. It would also help impact our kindergarten readiness rates going forward if we can get more students participating in pre-K programs. And it also has the potential to be a recruitment tool for FK Suite to interest more families in attending there. And um, in speaking to the Bezos organization, they have seen school districts use that strategy to attract students to a school. They have partnerships with K-12 systems, university systems, developers, hospitals, senior living facilities, all sorts of community agencies. And we've been talking to them along with Pete Tesh and the Economic Development Council and others um, to see if we could bring multiple locations but the one that would be housed in one of our schools could be at FK Suite in North Fort Pierce. And this program serves families up to 400% of the poverty level, and they do reserve 20% of their seats for the partner. So for example, that could be teachers at FK Suite that have preschoolers. This option would require a joint use agreement, a shared facility agreement. Um, they require on average about 5,000 square feet. They do a minimum of three classrooms and a maximum of five, and it's a 10-year agreement. We would work on a separate entrance for them, um, but in the partnership, the Bezos organization pays for shared costs, utilities, security, things like that, as well as um, renovations to the school that might be required. 
To do both of these plans, we would expect some minor renovations to be needed at CA Moore for middle school students, some furniture, and long range goal would be a future gymnasium. For FK Suite, we would need to do some uh, parking lot or entry uh, revisions, and then the Bezos organization would pay for the remainder. Now we're in very early conversations with them, so we don't have a partnership agreement. We really wanted to see how you felt about it conceptually before we move too far. We've really done just exploration, fact finding. Moving on to South St. Lucie County, where we had the pleasure of seeing all the rapid growth there today, um, referred to as the red zone. Um, we do know that every red zone school is, is already at or above capacity. Um, Mr. O'Leary mentioned today that developers have been reaching out to, to him and Marty about um, school locations and school construction. Um, we know that in St. Lucie County, most of the growth is predicted to be in South County. Um, and this not only leaves us no room for future students, but it also impacts our ability to provide additional ESE services and self-contained classrooms. We are seeing an increased need for ESE pre-kindergarten classrooms, especially in the red zone. And so there are not available rooms to keep adding those services. Our recommendation right now in South County is to accelerate the building and opening date for the new planned K-8. We had previously presented to the board an opening date of 27-28 school year, and now the recommendation is to accelerate that to the 26-27 school year. And also, as I mentioned before, to open red zone seats at Allapatta Flats. We went by the neighborhood there. We know there's three developments right there on um, Glades Cutoff, and those seats are going to be needed by the students that live nearby. And I think, uh, sorry, Dr. Wild, I think that's an important point uh, because of uh, the rapid construction of the single family homes. Uh, right now, St. Lucie County Public Schools does not have a, a footprint K 8 in, in the entire uh, area. The only schools there are the Tradition Prep, the Tradition Renaissance, and um, Palm Point, which uh, is a lottery school. So families in that community don't have an option, a, a convenient option for a public school. And as Dr. Wild said, almost all of our schools that are currently in that zone are just packed to the brim with students. So that was why one of the reasons we wanted you to meet the developers, because they're sharing with us the demand to escalate or accelerate uh, the building of the K-8 to try to get that open by 2026 rather than 2027. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Briggs. Okay, another strategy that we're going to need to face very shortly is um, our boundaries. And um, we haven't opened a new comprehensive high school uh, that wasn't already an existing school since Treasure Coast. And at that time, we did have to change boundaries for high school students, and we went with a new system. So you may or may not know that our controlled choice system of student assignment has been in place since 1991. And Michelle Jerger, who's here with us, was helping me research that. That's when the student assignment office actually opened. It was revised in 2006 with the opening of a new high school. But in grades K through eight, there are many choices that parents have to select from. But they're not all in close proximity to their homes. And so one of our goals as a community for a long time is to provide more, home, more choices that are just close to your residence. Um, right now, our high school and our K-8 zones do not line up into perfect feeder patterns. Our high schools are zoned by pure zip code, and then our K-8s have many, many choices. Um, our community demographics have changed drastically and, and are still continuing to change with all this growth since the inception of Control Choice in 1991. And it's always been um, an issue with Control Choice that our transportation costs do far exceed our allocations that we receive for transportation. So right now, our transportation allocation is approximately 11.5 million, and our actual costs are approximately 25 and a half million. Um, with the opening of Tradition Triple D, um, we know we're going to have to do boundary changes. 
So we have issued an intent to negotiate for uh, a consultant to work with us as we did back in 2006 to study the population, the trends, um, the, where we're gonna need future seats to be able to come up with a very comprehensive zoning plan that would be in the communication phase in 24, 25. Would not be implemented until 25, 26, would coincide with the opening of the new high school. Our goal would be to have proximity zones, and we're referring to it as our proximity zone project, um, that would give families more of a neighborhood school feeling and would lead to stronger K through 12 feeder patterns. There's a lot of benefits to that in terms of families knowing the, the pattern that their children were, will attend school into the future. And um, just as importantly, teachers and leaders being able to communicate across those lines for smoother transitions. And then there is, obviously, if we have more proximities, proximity zones, we will realize cost savings in transportation. Dr. Wild, can I jump in there real quick? So this is a real rethinking of how we assign students. And I just want the board members to understand right now we have controlled choice, which is it, it can be very confusing for families. For someone like myself who's been in multiple districts, you know, where I buy a home is kind of where I have an expectation that my child is going to go to school somewhere near that home. Uh, our current process is nothing like that. It's, it's absolutely nothing like that. We've got students that live uh, near Weatherby Elementary and they're being bused all the way out to Allapatta Flats. Uh, and, and that's because of the various capacities at the school and the, the whole um, controlled choice philosophy that was really from the early 90s from a desegregation order. Uh, and times have changed. If you look at a scatter plot of our population densities, we're a real melting, melting pot in St. Lucie County. The, the fastest growing number of students right now is Hispanics. In fact, 34% of our current students are Hispanics. Uh, the second is our black students at 33%, and our white students, it's about 30%. So we really don't have concentrated pockets of specific race. They're scattered all over the district. We have to really rethink how we're um, assigning our students because the current model is untenable financially. Uh, Helen just shared a slide with you that we are funded for $11 million in transportation costs, and we're paying 25 that we can't continue to do that as our growth continues to accelerate and that model is unsustainable over time. We just simply have to rethink it. So that's why we, this is a perfect time to, to, to go down this pathway is because we will be opening a new high school and a new K-8 and it's, a, it's an opportune time for us to really redefine how our students are assigned uh, schools in their proximity communities. Thanks, Helen. Another proposal that we are making is to look at how we're assigning students to our magnet schools. So with expanding options for families, there are so many more options than there were when we first opened Fairlawn and FK Suite and Lincoln Park as a magnet. Um, for those of you that may not be aware, those three magnet schools still have a very traditional application process where people can put their child's name on the list at birth if they so desire, and they remain on that list for a long time. The result that that is having now with all the choices that families have is that people are keeping their children on the list as a backup choice. So if they don't get into a school near their home or a school that um, you know, the child's friends are attending, they hold that seat. Then when they do let the student assignment office know that they have made a different decision, they are then looking at the rest of the wait list and calling those families. And in recent years, they have had to fill the school like three or four times in some cases to get that, those schools filled. And so we believe that the solution here would be to simplify the process and have all of our magnet schools having the same assignment process. We do have the three additional magnet schools now, Sam Gaines Academy of Emerging Technology, CAST, and Fort Pierce Westwood Academy. And the process there is that families apply 
before the year their child is eligible to enter that school, so kindergarten or um, ninth grade. In their eighth grade year, they would apply. That opens up before the regular ass assignment process, so they do get to find out if they got assigned to a magnet school before the rest of the district. That would put everybody on the same, and it would make people who didn't move here till their child was four have a chance to get in just like everybody else. Um, with that said, it would be a lottery system, but it's very important to us to keep our commitments to families. So for families who applied to get into those schools and are on the wait list now, we would continue to honor that. We wouldn't take any more going forward if we w went forward with this plan, but we would continue to honor their place on the wait list until those wait lists are exhausted. So they would be grandfathered into the process and the lottery would run around those seats. So they would be offered it. So that would be a, a dual system until those folks moved off the wait list. And we believe that in the end, this would result in a more efficient magnet school application process where people would know right away. And then the other thing is people who find out they don't get in because other people took their seat and then it opens up to them, they've gone ahead and made other decisions at, the, at that time. So this would simplify that, make it clear, and um, make communication so much easier around it. In addition, our, our admission process or our control pr process does allow families to change their schools throughout the year without even moving, without an address change. And this is very rare. Most school districts don't do that. You, you pick your school. If you have a choice, you pick your school and you start there and you remain there for the end, till the end of the year, at which point you could change schools again. Our proposal is that once a choice is made, that is your school for the, for the year, unless you move, if you have a change of address. And our, our reason for that is we know that um, high rates of mobility, which we currently have, are not the best thing for instruction. Students do better when they have stability within a school year. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but moving back and forth, we don't believe is in the best interest of our school success or the students involved. All right, I'm gonna jump in for the next item. You want yep, yep. Okay, so I just wanted to share with the board, currently we have uh, two items that are coming up for renewals in 2026. One is the half penny sales tax, which was initially passed in 2006 for 20 years. And the other is our um, referendum, which pays for teacher pay and it pays for a resource deputy on every campus, mental health services, and uh, just fine arts and ancillary support programs. Um, with new legislation, those cannot go in a primary. They have to go in a general election. And it's very uncomfortable to have two ballot items at the same time. I find that to be problematic. And in 2026, my concern is that voters will uh, vote for one and not the other, or not vote for either one, or they'll cancel each other out and we won't pass either one of them. These are absolutely critical, especially in a time of fast growth. Uh, with regards to the half penny sales tax, that's gonna help defer the cost of some of this construction. We'll also be in the middle of a number of construction jobs that our schools can see. And we're also putting together, um, basically on our website, to show our families what the half penny has paid for over the last 20 years, what it's done at my school, it's put on a roof, new chillers, paint, technology, all the things that that has done uh, with, with regards to, to the voters and that commitment we've made to the voters. Uh, because a lot of times the voters want to know, you know, what has it done for, for my child? And also looking ahead for the next five years, what is it going to pay for at my child's school? So we have done some uh, initial polling with regards to a polling service. We do not pay for that. It's illegal for the district to pay for that. But we have raised money through some of our uh, developers to see if the voters would be likely to uh, pass a, a half penny sales tax in 2024. And the polling has been very, very positive. In fact, it's been incredibly strong. So right now, uh, our community thinks the school district is heading in the right direction 
and it's heading in the right direction, not just fiscally, but educationally. So that is going to be my recommendation, is to do the half-penny sales tax in 2024. Now, this will not be the same ballot language. We always work on the ballot language, um, whether we're looking at 20 years, 10 years, 8 years, uh, or whatever. I'll bring that to the board, but this is just getting a consensus of the board that we can explore this as we move into uh, 2024, because it will be absolutely critical uh, for us to get this passed. Um, and you can see there the rationale, it separates the two votes. We'll have one in 2024, one in 2026. And it's uh, during the general election, there's usually a greater turnout of voters in a presidential election. Um, and it also is in, in alignment with um, our visible construction projects. As families go out and drive around, they can see things going up left and right. And from a perception standpoint, we think we've got a, a very good chance at, at getting it passed in 2024. So we can check that box. And then in 2026, we'll be back with the voters on the, uh, the uh, referendum, which addresses teacher pay and school safety and security. to you for discussion. One is to move the timeline on the new K-8 to 26-27, so move it one year early. Another is to transition CA Moore to a K-8 school. Another is to bring a partnership into FK Suite to provide preschool seats, full, full year free preschool seats. And another is to revise our controlled choice policies to proximity zones, which would take a two-year implementation period, community input, and lots of work to be done there. Also, magnet school application process revisions, and uh, that one change in policy about mobility and the number of times uh, parents can change schools within one school year. And then the final thing is uh, the recommendation to move the sales tax uh, voting timeline up to 2024. Dr. Prince? So at, at this time, um, Mr. Chair, I would say if uh, I just wanted to hear if we had any questions. It's been a long meeting, and, and the reason it's been a long meeting is, is I can't move forward with, with some of these initiatives without hearing from board members because these are very intricate and involved uh, projects that we'll have, you know, I'll be directing staff on. But I do think that these are very important. It would be my recommendation that we we move forward with these things. I think from a financial standpoint um, and, a, and also a public policy standpoint with regards to the sales tax, and also it addresses some of the challenges we have with enrollment in our green zone schools. The Bezos uh, preschool was something Dr. Wild and I was, were interested in when we visited Blue Origins a few months ago. We were invited and we talked to other superintendents that had some successful initiatives with the preschool program. And it, it creates um, a feeder pattern, po potentially for FK Suite, but also creates some flexibilities, and it's a, a recruitment tool for, te for young teachers, especially if they have uh, preschool-age children, to, uh, to come to the school and work. Uh, CA Moore, we need to provide family opportunities. CA Moore is um, on an upward trajectory as a community school. Dr. Jackson is a fantastic principal. She was excited about the possibility of discussing this and it creates more family options if you want to keep your kids together. And uh, the K-8, I think that's just a common sense after you went out and saw the construction and what we're hearing from the developers, uh, that that is something I would like to move forward with is moving up that project a year from 2027 to 2026. And I just wanted to be able to answer any questions before we, we kind of unleash the hounds and, and <laughs> try to try to move forward in some of these projects. Okay, board members, let's go ahead and just start at the top. The new K-8, to eight. is there any discussion or questions? If I can. Sure. Sure, go ahead. What do you need? The first three things here are, they're no-brainers. Uh, they have to be done the sooner the better. I mean, when you got a school that's only using half of its capacity, it, they're, they're just no-brainers, those first three things. Do you need the board 
to make a motion to vote on those, or can you, can you just get, can you No, get oh, these are not voting items consent? today. These are just simply, I wanted to hear from the board. Well, I'm just asking you. Yeah, you just yes, sir. consensus. Okay, then. Yeah. I'd, I'd call for consensus on them. One at a time, I guess. I don't know, but well, I have a couple of questions about some of them. Okay, yep. okay, go ahead. But I'm just asking. But yeah, yeah, I mean that's why we're here. At the end of the discussion, yeah. maybe we can just yeah. get it done. Yeah. Anyone on the first one? So that, that seems pretty good, Ms. Richardson. Um, so the K through eight school, this, um, and just to, um, I guess, make sure that I'm on the same page. The K through eight school that you're proposing is going to be, and we're looking at making all of these schools, therefore then, neighborhood schools. I'm sorry, Mr. Superintendent, neighborhood schools. Well, the, the plan would be in 25 or 24, 25 um, to look at proposals to bring to the board with regards to recommendations to go to more proximity zoning. So the answer to your question, Mrs. Richardson, is the the school that we would build in that tradition area would be a, a com designed to be a community school. A neighborhood school. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So that was that was my question as far as the K through eight school. So it will it will service those kids in that area. Should a parent want their child to go to that school, which we know that's going to happen, it's a new school, so everybody wants their kids to go there, then what? How does that process? Well, the process is not, has not been designed yet. Uh, I'm just saying that we're gonna be exploring what our process is, but our process will be for a proximity. If you're living close to that school, that would be the initial school you would, you would go to. But we're in the initial phases. Um, the biggest challenge we have right now is the transportation costs. The transportation costs that we're driving students all over the place, we've got to, to make some adjustments to that. So the whole idea of going to a more proximity um, uh, student assignment process, I don't know what it looks like yet, but that the idea of it, that's why we've done an RFP for a company to come in and take a look at our district and make us recommendations, which I would bring to the board. Okay, I. Do I have friends may expand that? Yep, yep. Yes, the uh, intent to negotiate with the consultant would be to develop the answers to all those questions in terms of what would the boundaries look like in terms of automatic assignment to the school and that more of a neighborhood or proximity zone concept. In addition, there is something called controlled open enrollment, and that is if there are seats still available people can select to go to a school that is not in their neighborhood. So that's done during a certain period of the year through the student assignment office. So if that parent you're referring to does not live within the zone, whatever that zone looks like that we develop, that parent lives outside that, there's still a possibility, but we have to give first access to the people who are zoned for the school. So that varies depending on how full a school is. So therefore it's going to be like another um Palm Point then, where you pretty much, it, well, no, Palm Point is a lottery. It's not necessarily a, um, a, 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 a lottery and it yes. serves the entire school district, mm -hmm. not, not the community of tradition. Yeah, okay, all right. But I'm just saying that even you're asking for, um, for the board to give you the consensus, which you, you <laughs> um, but, um, but you know, there are other things that needs to be, you know, kind of finalized or worked through. So we are just giving you wanting a consensus just to build a school at one year ahead of time. The, yes, else. that's to, for us to start pursuing that possibility. It's just I just wanted to, to run this by the board um, because if we don't do it, the developers will go to the charters and they'll do it. They'll do it lickety split. So, but they, 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 I think our developers have a strong belief in, in the direction of our school district. They're coming to us. They know that we need a public school there. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're asking us to move up our timeline as a result of their strong development uh, projections over the next few years. Okay, I'm just getting a little ahead of myself then. You just wanted to move it up a year. That yes. Okay, thank you. And that, that would be, um, Chairman? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. That would be that, uh, Number one, which is the K-8 new school moving up a year. 
Um, I kind of heard quite a bit going being said so far, and it looked like kind of controlled choice policies kind of got mixed in with. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. We really so, want to just focus on number one. So You're right. Focusing Thank on you. just that one, right. that bullet point. Yes. I'm definitely all for it because I know that we need to have a public school in that area with this huge growth that we're having. Uh, the tour that I took today, I, I've been in St. Lucie West for over 25 years I've lived in St. Lucie West, right? I took that tour today and Port St. Lucie is so huge, it was like mind blowing. And the expansion of the population and what is in the plan, we have to keep up with that. So for me, um, this, this first one, first bullet that we're dealing with is, as we like to say, a no-brainer for the number one, for me. And, and you know, that's my, my comment for that. Well, I, I think the comment that is when you're selling 300 homes a month, we do have to be proactive in making sure that students have an opportunity to get a quality public education. So we're going to go ahead and move on. Any other comment? We're going to go ahead and move on to Chester A. Moore Elementary, transition to K-8. Is there any question there? Give them a consensus on number one as we go or on the end or how do you want to do okay, it? Okay, let's go ahead and just do that just for the record. Consensus, just thumbs. Thumbs up, yeah. Thumbs up. Dr. Mills, is your thumb up? On number one. On number one? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have my consensus. There you go. Chester A. Moore Elementary transition to a K-8. Any discussion? Um, yes. You're going to have a discussion for me for all of them, so. Um, Mr. Chairman, so um, the Chester A. Moore, the to transition to a K-8 is, it sounds very good. Uh, no problems with that. But we are moving, the, my, the way I'm looking at it is that you're moving the kids up from the elementary school, they'll just move up in, in the same school, same area. They'll Correct. just move up. If they choose to. If they choose to. But, but by the same token, if it's a, a neighborhood school, then they would go to the other schools by choice in the neighborhood, correct? Correct. Okay, so it's a K through eight, and that's fine. We are having a hard time, or apparently, filling the school because it's built for 800 and something, we have 300 and something um, there. How are we going to, to fill the school um, to capacity there for then? How does that work? Yes, yeah, so this would add 225 I'm students. sorry, Mr. Superintendent. No, no, that, I, I'm, she's ready for this question, so answer away, Dr. Wild. This would add 225 middle school students, and then that would leave, if I recall, around 200 more seats, because we are making the assumption based on past practice that more families would want to select CA more because it's a K-8. That we hear from our families that they do like to keep their kids together longer. Families that have two and three kids across different grade levels, that's attractive to them, to have the older sibling you know, walking the younger sibling home. So that would not only add 225 seats, it would attract more families to fill the seats. Our goal would be to fill it to capacity, but it would be a multi-year plan, phase-in plan. But if we are not filling it now, what's the guarantee if it becomes a K through eight school that it's going to be filled? Well, it's but not a K eight now, so that that one change would be a benefit to families that they don't currently have. So that is one thing. And then because we're making it a K eight, we would be adding more curriculum, and then we would be marketing that curriculum. Okay. That program. So thank you. So my question would be the curriculum because. Right now, Chester A. Moore is, you know, it's not an A school, okay? So what kind of curriculum, therefore, are we going to add, or this in the working stage as well, to, um, to draw people as an attractor to that school, to draw these parents to want their kids to not only go to the school, but to stay in that school from, to K, to, um, and, and, K to, to my, eight. And, and to my point, 
this, is a, this conversation allows us to explore that. I'm not going to be doing anything until I bring it back to the board with what I want to do. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Sam Gaines, K8, five years ago had earned two consecutive Fs and a D, and that school is now, it's, I, I believe it's going to be an A this year. You know, we went down that road to try to reinvigorate uh, some of our North End schools, and we believe that with CA Moore, this is an opportunity for us to offer some uh, programs and opportunities for our families that would be uh, exciting and enticing to expand um, interest in the school. And I also think we have a transformational leader in Dr. Jackson that, that can make that happen. So we want to try to make sure that we're striking while the iron is hot. But to your point, Mrs. Richardson, I don't know what that program is yet, but it's just, okay, so this conversation is so we can explore that and then bring it back to the board to see what you think. Okay. And, and Dr. Jackson does have experience with this type of change and bringing in different curriculum to attract families. She has early college programs that she's done in the past in elementary and middle in multiple counties. Um, we just had a, a discussion about what some of the opportunities could be, and we just I just said, don't get too excited yet. We need to hear the board's direction, but if, if we were able to move forward and collect input, I know we'd be able to put together a really strong, attractive curriculum for the families. Actually, I, I agree with you. Um, Dr. Jackson is amazing, and she's actually, uh, you know, going to be leaving us shortly. Um, you know, she's not going to be, uh, well, She's in a drop program, is she, is she not? Yeah, but drop just got extended to eight years. <laughs> so okay. she, she, she may be with us for, uh, okay. for eight more years, that's, but yes. That, that's awesome, all right, yes. so therefore then we can, okay. The, real, the, the reality of this is not the curriculum, it, it's not anything, it's building of the capacity of a school. You're adding 50 more students that are not gonna wanna go to Forest Grove or to Dan McCarty, they're gonna wanna stay in the family environment in their community. This is a win for the school. And as that school continues to grow, it will grow pride in the community and in the school. That's the purpose of the K-8, to and that's how this district wins. Ms. Ringersall, she wanted to start tomorrow because her fifth graders were so sad to be leaving. All right, that's, that, 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 that's, that's my point, is you got 50, 50 kids that you have, you wanna keep them there, that you've had them for a while, you're gonna get more families involved. And, and I will say, Mr. Ingersoll, conceptually, when I first got to this district, I'd never been exposed to K-8s. Uh, we didn't have K-8s in Palm Beach County. We didn't have K-8s in Orange County. And I didn't know, quite honestly, if I really liked that concept, uh, having the younger kids around the older kids. But two of my children went to a K-8, and I realized the community environment that it created and also the care that older siblings have for their younger siblings. You know, so I, I think it is an exciting opportunity that we could really do some great things there. Dr. Mills, can you speak into your microphone a little bit? I have a concern about the neighbor, the neighborhood type school concept. And my concern is to ensure that if a school is located such as CA Moore in a poverty area of St. Lucie County, there are a lot of parents that do not want their child to attend that school, especially if that school has been a low performing school. I think that's the main thing. You know, we've got some lower performing schools and I can see the concept of moving it up to uh, grade eight, from K to eight, I can see you have more uh, families that have options to be able to have their children attend that school. But my concern is to make sure that to the best of our ability, which we're working on that, but we're not there with some of the, our lower performing schools, is to make sure that they are getting exactly what any other school would be getting. And I know we like to think of we're in a different times you know, today and we no longer need that type of thing. But if you talk to individual parents and people in the community, uh, they will tell you something else. And so uh, it's going to be very important for us to ensure that, you know, we've got Dan McCarty, 
Dan McCarty has struggled for many, many years, as well as C.A. Moore. What are we going to do to not just have it open for a neighborhood? Because a lot of parents rather have their child bust if they think they're in a better school, okay? If they think there's better teachers, if they think the school has a better um, uh, grade point average, you know, I get calls, I just got a call yesterday. Can you tell me what school in my zone is the best school for my ESE student, okay? Because parents want the best for their, for their kids. So I have a concern there. When we say neighborhood schools, I haven't, I have to admit, I haven't been to Dan McCarty for a while. It's been a few years. But years ago, when I went to Dan McCarty, um, it was just a whole different atmosphere. It almost looked like a prison, you know? So what, are, and I've heard that we've gotten a lot better within those couple of few years that I was not there, but we, the school is still struggling when it comes to their um, grade point average. So you got to tell, you got to convince me that this process, and I know CA more right now, it could, we definitely need to do something different. So I'm like here with it. You know, I know we need to do something different for CA more. But what is that difference that, we're, that we need to do? And is it really bringing in, um, crowding the school up even more with more students uh, because we've added eighth grade to it, seventh, sixth grade to it. So I, I'm, I, I'm open, but I need to know that that school is gonna move up and do much better and it's not gonna fall behind. Sam Gaines is a perfect example. You brought up Sam Gaines. How K through eight, it's been a K through eight school for a long time, but it was a failing K-8. Mm -hmm. So we did some changes there, um, and a lot of that did have to do with curriculum mm -hmm. and what we brought to the school and what parents wanted. Oh, my kid gets a chance to do this, to do that. So talk to us about that, please. Well, opportunity should be colorblind, Dr. Mills. And it should be. And, and it should be, it shouldn't matter how much money your parents make. Um, all I can say is we, uh, want to approach this as I do believe that if you mobilize from a district standpoint that you're going to improve a situation that you can improve that situation and I just think that if we explore this idea and we're creative I think that we can create a real thriving K-8 program at CA more and I and I just like I'll never forget um, uh, at one point Dr. Gaines had said that he was ashamed to have that school named after him and you know that that was jarring to hear him say that but that's completely changed now because we put our minds together we said we're going to get it done and it took some time but we got it done so i think that that's kind of the same kind of thinking that we want to invigorate uh, the opportunities for children in our community and so that they're they've got a school they can be proud of and i think this is the first step of that is having this conversation so that we can look at, okay, what can we do there? But I, I, the first step of that is for my board members to say, okay, let's see what you can come up with. Prince, um, um, the, the, thank you, Dr. Mills, for saying what I was, what I was actually saying. Mm -hmm. Without, um, yeah. But anyway, so that's exactly what it, what it is. That those, when I was asking about how we're going to fill the schools and the curriculum, because it has, there has to be something that's going to draw the parents there, that's going to want to have them stay there. And it has to be specific, I think, to the demographic, to those kids. It can't be just anything. Sam's, Sam Gaines is doing an amazing job, thanks to Mr. Keith Davis. He's yes, the principal? Yes, He's Keith the principal, Davis. okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. So the anointing starts at the top. He's doing an amazing job. So maybe we want to look and see what he's doing and maybe replicate it at other schools. I don't know if you have done that, but that's what I'm, I'm sorry. That's what I'm talking about when I say about and, and talk about the neighborhood schools, because if we have just those kids in that school, in the neighborhood school, it has to be exponentially amazing 
because we want to bring out stuff. And, and I think when you have a lot of people, a melting pot of people together, then they can play off each other. But when you're going to have one demographic to, just like that, then we need to have something that is amazing that is going to bring out the giftings in those kids because of the neighborhood that they are in. I agree with you. Go ahead, Mr. Kelly. Just a couple of things. One, one thing is, uh, I hear what you're saying, Donna. Uh, it would give an option. It, I know it's a neighborhood school, but it gives an option, like it says here, for the entire green zone. It would give another option. <coughs> the second thing is, uh, I understand what you're both saying. Uh, the school needs to be a better school and attract more people. Uh, you folks have done this before. You've changed a, a, a grammar school. To, to, and I was talking to Mr. Gent when I first came on board, asked them about it, and the school actually did better. And overall, I understand schools in Florida that go from uh, to, to K through fives to K through eights overall have done better. They have done better overall. That's what I understand. I'm asking you that question. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Yeah. All right. uh, and th to have the attraction to make the school better, I think that's another subject, and it's absolutely important that we try to make them better. That's what we're supposed to do all the time. Okay. So what we're talking about here is, as a school board member speaking for myself, I got a school that's only half full. So my, my option here, I don't see any other option, but to make it a better school, fill those seats, make it a K, K through, it, it, to me it's, it's, it, it's a non, I, I just, it has to be done. And it, along with that, so what we're gonna do here is pursue, if we're gonna uh, not make a motion, but have a consensus here, it should be pursue Chester A. Moore Elementary a transition to a, a K through eight school and uh, pursue that and give, make a plan have them come back with a plan to make it a better school and how we're going to do it. But right now, I want to fill those seats and make it a better school, like you say. So I still think that we should go along with that and pursue the option. I think that we should give him a... I think a what you're saying right now, we should explore. Okay. Yes, that's, all, that's all we're asking for, really. Is and the other thing is, is we're not filling it in. We're growing the school through the process. Right. The same kids are staying there. We're not bringing more and more kids in. We're, we're keeping the same kids. And yes, the school is going to grow another section or two in first, second, and third grade. But you're not bringing, attracting more. That will come once the school is a B and A school. And within two years, the school will be a B and A. I guarantee it. So it's okay. 50 kids next year. Then another 50 kids in sixth grade, or sixth grade 50 kids, and another kids 50 kids seventh grade. So you added 100 kids. That's 100. That's 450. And then you're going to order, order, have another 50. So you can see how the numbers are going to grow within itself. We understand that, and I think that's that's a, that's a no-brainer. But my thing is, what are we going to put? It has to be specific. That's all I'm saying, okay. is that it has to be specific for that demographic, for those kids. Um, back in the days when we were going to school, it was a one-size-fit-all. We have learned now that it does not work that way. So I'm just saying that when you bring this back to the board, well, um, that I would like to see something that is going to be specific for those kids that is going to epitomize all children are capable of success, no exception. That's all I'm saying. I am for that, Mr. Kelly. I'm all for Chester Earmore. Expanding. Thank yeah, you. I agree. You know, I want to just to, to your point, Mrs. Richardson, uh, in Connecticut, where I'm from, uh, you've heard of Yale University, I'm sure. Yale University, I hope nobody from New Haven hears this, New Haven, Connecticut, but <laughs> Yale, New Haven could not be in the worst neighborhood in the entire country. Yale, New Haven, that school, that whole university is in the worst pit. It couldn't be worse where it is. And when you drive there and you visit, you gotta have a guard to watch your car. You could, couldn't be in a worse place. And still it's Yale New Haven. So I understand your point. So what we wanna pursue here is not just transition from K through eight, but we wanna make it a better school. Absolutely. So that's what, 
the consensus we should give them now, and I, I'm going to ask you to call for consensus. Let's on that. go ahead and see your thumbs. And this is just to move forward and see what we come up yes, with. Yeah. Yep. Plan pursuing. Yes, Correct. FK Suite opening a Bezos school, preschool. Okay, Montessori. Same. Yes. Same Montessori. Thing. You said it's a Montessori curriculum. Correct. Right? Explain what a Montessori curriculum is. Yes, it is a it's a free year round pre K for three and four year olds, and Montessori is a nationally known uh, curriculum. And it does allow students to explore their interest areas, get deeper in their interest areas. They also work on focus, teaching kids to focus on certain areas. Um, there's a lot of play, similar to our Play and Repurpose program. Um, that's an important component for them. Um, they, teach, they teach students um, all the types of skills they would need. They have family style uh, meals where they teach them you know, how to do all the things they need to do to have a family style meal, how to treat each other and so forth. Um, but a lot of it is self-exploration and interest driven at that young age when preschoolers are trying to discover their interests mm -hmm. and what sparks their love of learning. And are we talking about still the same grade level but just adding the school? Yes. The preschool. We're, we're talking about bringing in this um, really well-known pre-K program into FK Suite. It would be St. Lucie County's first partnership along these lines. And, um, and then that could serve as a feeder program as well. Those students could then select to stay at FK Suite. Uh -huh. But it would no longer be a magnet school. Uh, we have not talked about removing their magnet school status. We've only talked about changing. It's the, the second bullet under control choice about changing their application process. mention I think I going back through this uh, this Montessori is, is that a program or is that just a connotation or that that's preschool that would go along with this that they would add to it the, the FK suite in grades K through 5 you mean yeah is that where we were talking about the Montessori program or the Montessori, the Montessori is specific to the Bezos Academy their preschool they are a certified Montessori program um, there are certain components that they have to follow to be a Montessori Montessori in grades K through five, it is an option. It is something we could implement, but that's not yet part of any proposal that we have. See, but that's, Mrs. Richardson, that's the type of thing that adds to the, you know, adds to the- Oh, that question was for me, for my benefit? The Montessori, yeah, that's oh. like for you. I, I knew what that, a Montessori was, to, you know, thank you. I don't, and I don't fully understand it, I just know people like it. <laughs> thank you. It's, a, it's more of a um, structured, Preschool with fun, with play, yeah. with focus, more focused, um, and it's a it's a it's one of the schools that you hear people say they like that. So yeah. that would definitely be an attractor to Francis K. Sweet. Um, my opinion is to move forward with the options of. I, I have a couple questions. Yeah. Is it rent free? Because because I saw that. It is. It's a 10 year agreement of shared use. They don't pay yeah, rent. Yeah. They pay shared utilities, security, shared costs. They do modifications. Um, but the partnership part, what we give them is the space. What they give us is the community service, shared costs. They pay all of the teacher's salaries and they pay um, competitively. Yeah. Um, and then they provide this free service to families. 400% of the poverty rate, um, they do give first preference to homeless and foster children. Well, what's the difference between going to an organization in town and having offering a free place to, to do business as opposed to this? Well, Bezos has an established system now in place that is finding a lot of success. And, and their organization pays for everything. That's why it's free. The partnerships that we have, like the partnership at Windmill Point, is not free. They give a discounted rate because of the free rent, but the families are paying for that child care. This is free to the families completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the government gives you VBK money for it. This is three and four. They don't give? And they don't use those certificates. So True. they are not using the VBK certificates through the Early Learning Coalition. It is separate, so it literally does add additional seats mm -hmm. to the community above and beyond the VBK through the Early Learning Coalition. And, and we have Tony Luke 
Luke has been involved in this conversation as well. And it's a 10 year? It's a 10 year commitment. Troy, it's a good deal. It's free money, but we control. We still have control. No, That's the main thing. I, I don't know yeah. if it's a good, I mean, I, I, this is the first I've heard of it. Oh. But, what, but when I hear that you're using a government building to give to a private organization. But they aren't making any money. It's completely philanthropic because they are charging the families and they are paying the salaries and all of the additional costs. What it is is a very, very rich man trying to provide oh, opportunities for I know Steve Bezos. So you watch kids. TV, he's getting married. Yeah. He's staying at somebody's mansion out in California. Right. It's also but I, I know three, Doug Bezos. Three meals a day and snacks. Um, three meals a day. And one of our biggest issues is kindergarten readiness and also participation in pre-K programs. This is a unique program. And when Dr. Wild and I kind of explored this idea with other districts, they're just having a lot of success. And if we could secure this, I think it would be a feather in the cap for the district. And not just that, I think it provides a potential feeder pattern for students to stay at FK Suite. You're always looking at ways to reinvigorate a program. And this is doing it from the ground up. That's, that's how I feel about it. So they're not going to get any government assistance. Not, obviously not from the school district, but they're not going to get any cent, FTE, nothing on they this child. Any, they don't get FTE, and to my knowledge, they don't get any additional government funding. And, and it's an attraction provide, to the school, like Mrs. And Richardson says. they provide says. an excellent education yes. for preschoolers. Yeah. So that is getting them ready and prepared for the next level for grade school. And we are working with EDC and others to see if we can get to South County locations as well. Mm -hmm. And they would be other partners. So the school district would only be one partner, and then we're looking for two more partners. And it has to be a 10-year commitment. Yes. And how many students would they be? Depends on the amount of space that we provide. They do a minimum of three classrooms, a maximum of five, 20 students per class, and it's fully staffed with tiered system of lead teachers, teachers, and assistants. I think the 10 year is a long, a long period to see if it works or not, you know, when you make a contract for 10 years. Well, but you're trying to make a commitment for growth, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that this is a community that needs, you know, early child care. Yep. And, uh, um, and I'm just saying, you ask me to come up with potential solutions, <laughs> and I'm working hard at it, you know, to, well, to try well, to. Well, we, we understand that, but yeah. to, to just hear it in a five minute. Yeah, thing, but I'm just saying, know, but, remember, little... but remember, Mr. Ingersoll, this is to explore this. Yeah. This is not like it's a done deal. That's it's just to, to continue to gather information. I'm not going to take a bunch of staff time to have something signed, sealed, delivered, and bring it to the board without saying, okay, is this something you want us to? To look into and that's why we're having it is a 10-year commitment but we need to get more information so I can share more information with the board prior to a decision made by the board mm -hmm. and it, it is a big commitment but I think it's it's an investment with our young kids it's worth making because I do think it's a difference maker it does require some written contracts that would come to the board it also requires an on-site visit from them they start with receiving blueprints from us which we have not sent to them yet we're just conversation and learning and exploring at this point. So you're keeping the board full awareness of every move basically that you're making before it comes to for vote for anything. Yes, so it's absolutely. Just, it's just the beginning. Yeah. Oh, I understand, but I, you know, I, I, we went to a conference two months ago, saw this, we've already been in touch with the EDC. That's what I'm saying is this is, you know, we're, and, and then we're just heard this for the last five minutes. So, so as that, it turns yeah. out, um, I had, I had already looked into it previously, and then when we met people who had experience with it, it kind of sparked it. And when I got back, I discovered that Tony Luke had already met with them, and then I discovered that EDC had already met with them. So okay. we just came together around this shared So desire. we didn't go out to them? We did not uh, go okay, out to okay, them. Okay, okay, um, okay. Pete has left for the day, but he did uh, mention it to me, and I said, I just spoke with him, and he had just spoken to so we just did a joint conference with them. We had all done it separately previously. Okay. Mr. Chair, all, all the people that I've talked to, like a lot of academics in my family and people, I, I'm told that we're fortunate to be asked to be part of that program. It's a great program, and uh, I wish we could do it at 
Chester A. Moore, Mrs. Richardson. That would, because to your point, I agree with you. You got to have an attraction. So uh, at this point, Mrs. Dr. Mills, you just asked, you were asking for a consensus. Yeah, let's uh, go ahead and take a consensus. Dr. Yeah. Prince, um, I would like to say that I absolutely like, it's like that play learning thing. I, I, I do, I like this a lot. I think Mr. Bezo has a lot of money, so he's not going to run out in 10 yeah, years. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't yeah. think that that's a concern of mine. Yeah. As long as they are paying for it, as long as yeah. our children are benefited from it, especially the children in that area that actually needs it, right. that needs to be prepared and needs to be ready for kindergarten. I think that's an amazing, yeah. amazing program. If we can get it, I'm telling you, Two okay. thumbs up. You got my thumbs. If we can get it here for those kids, and if we can use it in that, maybe just you know a pilot program. If it works, we get it in the other schools and get our kids ready so that again epitomizes all children are capable of success. If nothing else, I know no exception. So I'm all for that. Thank yeah. you. And it gives it gives us an, it opens up the door, Mrs. Richardson. Just like Absolutely. you said. Absolutely. So uh, thank you. You know, Bezos actually has more money than Troy. That's what I understand. You think? I certainly hope so. You should see the mansion he's renting. Can we get a, consensus? That, we got a consensus on that. Ben. It's on TMZ this morning. Okay, John. <laughs> you got all. All righty. Let's go ahead and go on to controlled choice policy. Conversation. Um, do you want to separate these into the three different components? Well, let's just keep them all together. Uh, let's see how it well, goes. I don't know. Uh, well, that's what you said. let's just see how it goes. I like to I like to go with proximity zones first. I want to understand better what you guys are thinking without bringing it all together. All right, go ahead. Okay, let's do thank that. You. So, um, Dr. Mills, thank you for that. The consultant would be working with us to look at the predicted growth, where it is, along with where the new K-8 location is, where the new high school is, um, looking at the number of kids per family, you know, all the stuff that um, Marty and Terrence were talking about on the bus ride this morning. And then they would make a recommendation to us after collecting community input. Um, some of you may remember when we did that back in 2006, um, we do get community input and ask questions about number of choices people would like. And our goal isn't, uh, we don't believe it's possible in our community to have uh, just a neighborhood school that's assigned to your zip code like our high schools are. There would still be s s choice. And that's why they're called proximity zones. You'd have fewer choices than they currently have, but you'd still have choice. Um, and, but they would all be closer to your home. Um, that would be the... That would be the goal of working with this consultant to add proximity zones. And to uh, Dr. Prince's point, people expect to attend a school closer to home, and so they always ask us about that. And for, with the diversity all across the county and the changes in density of population, we're not, we don't have the same needs that we had in 1991, um, nor are we seeing the same impact of control choice. So we just feel we have to make boundary changes every time we open a new high school. This is the time to study our assignment process and our assignment zones um, and look at where the boundaries need to be to make sure that our schools are, are full and you know, used to full capacity um, and that people still have choices and the community is pleased with those choices. Would so that, that is our goal of working with a consultant and involving the community. Would that change the district Dr. zones? Mills, can you move your microphone closer, please? I'm sorry. Would that change the district zones as far as board members and none of it no, won't mess with none of that? Unrelated to that. Okay. No, we would still have choice. I mean, we, we it's just the choices would be closer to your proximity simply because, you know, we mentioned the whole transportation issue is just becoming so unwieldy how far we're transporting students. And I'll give you an example, Allapatta Flats. Allapatta Flats, we were busing a, a, a large number, hundreds of students, we still bus out there, that live in the green zone. Um, and now, we have to have room for all of the, the students that, of all the houses you saw going up around there. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, it's a perfect time to rethink all of this because we're opening the new high school in 2025 and potentially a K-8 in 2026. So now is the time. We're going to have to do it anyway. 
So that's why we're bringing in a consultant to make some recommendations just to kind of shrink those zones up a little bit so you've got multiple choices within a zone, but they might be a little tighter. I'm Dr. Prince, um, and, and that's, that's fine as far as that goes. My concern with the proximity, again, is uh, the proximity. You know, um, that certain kids are going to certain schools in certain areas, and I'm talking about the green zone, and you know, people, they're go you're gonna want to send your school in the area, and you live in a particular area for a particular reason, you know? So we, I think that when you do the proximity zoning, um, there's, it is, that's why it's important that the schools, we, we, we set the bar higher for the schools, especially in the green zone, we set the bar higher for them, and or ex raise our expectations because that's it's going to be important. We cannot have an area uh, where the kids are, you know, the bar is whatever, you know, and then we have these other. It can't be that way. It has to be equity across the board. So whatever it is we are doing and are bringing in to those areas has to be at the same level. The bar has to be at the same place for the proximity zone to work or to be equitable. If, I don't know if that's a dirty word, to be equitable. Okay, so that would be my concern with the proximity zone. My children, I chose to bus them, to bus them, to drive them to FK Suite and they were on a waiting list. I chose that because FK Suite was an amazing school and went to Lincoln Park as well and they were on the list because of that reason. So those standards, are the standards that we still need to have across the board in those areas. I agree. Yes, ma'am. Um, and you know, I feel the same way that Ms. Richardson is saying, but I must say this, we have come a long ways. And the work that has been done thus far in the past seven years has been incredible. And I want to make sure that we all know that. Those of us that's been around, we realize how far we've come, okay? We've come a long ways. And so I have the utmost um, faith in what our district is doing right now and what you're doing as superintendent and everybody in their several different departments. And that's why I'm comfortable with you know us moving forward because we've been moving forward. Nothing happens overnight. We all get that. But we've been on the right path moving forward in all of our schools. I'm just, I'm just still concerned about those lower performing schools where we want to make sure that we can get them, as Ms. Richardson was saying, Ms. Richardson was saying to a place, and we're working on that. You guys have been working incredibly hard. We know that um, uh, certain areas, areas of poverty is associated a lot with how a school performs, but it's not the end all. And we're able to, to really take that school, and we have done that. We've done it with Sam Gaines. C.A. Moore has done a lot better, you know. Um, I am still wondering about Dan McCarty and, and St. Lucie Elementary, but that's another story. But we're working toward that, and we've been growing. I just don't want us to go back. I don't want any of the schools to go back, but I have the utmost faith that you guys can do it. So I'm don't. with you all the way in this, and I tell you, for me, um, th what we're talking about now, I'm kind of thinking like um, Mr. Uh, Kelly said, it's a no-brainer at this point with certain areas where we want to see growth and we want to move forward. Well, whatever we decide to do, we'll bring to the board multiple options. I mean, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. We're going to provide the board with multiple options once we have the consultant, you know, come in, and that's usually how it goes is we workshop it and we have a discussion about this option, this option, or this option so that hopefully that porridge is just right, whatever the board decides on. So, but, but we've got years to do this. So it's, I just wanted to, to let you know that that's kind of the direction I would like to take us, um, but you'll be informed along the way. So when you say years, how many, five years? 
No, we're looking, this would uh, probably hit in 2025 because as soon as that high school opens up in August 2025, that, that's the trigger point where everything is gonna change. So whatever we do in the 2024, 2025 year will be our communication plan to our families to make sure our families know in 2025 what the impact, maybe it won't be any impact, or maybe they, they might, the recommendation would be for some students would have to have a choice of either staying at their school or they would get this option. So 2025, to your point, Mrs. Richardson, that's when it would happen. And Dr. Mills, I, I, I was going to say to you that you mentioned about Dan, Dan McCarty, and I'm just gonna say that Dan McCarty, you'd like to say, has come a long way. They have an amazing principal there and they're doing amazing there. That's why I have complete confidence know, right? in what you guys are doing, go for it. And, and once again, with the magnet school application process, all of our commitments to current families, that is unchanged. This will be not any change for anybody that's on a wait list or the process that we have in place. It's moving forward. Helen, do you wanna give a, just a brief recap of that? Right, yes, moving forward, we would be asking anybody interested in a magnet school to apply the year before their child is eligible when we're out advertising our magnet programs and when they offer families they would make their selection then. And then th the lottery would be run rather than a wait list that is established five or eight years before a student is going to attend. However, um, Dr. Prince was very clear when we first started talking about this that we will honor commitments to any family who has put their child on the list and intends that their child go to those magnet schools. So until that wait list moves off, you know, moves out, um, we would give, they would get the first seats and then the lottery for additional seats would be run around it. So that's how that would operate. And it's currently how we do Sam Gaines, Westwood, and CAST. It's just aligning our older schools with those schools. Correct. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that Dr. Weil hit the nail on the head when she uh, gave her presentation. Over the last couple of years, I've had 10, 12 people tell me, <clears throat> Jack, we, uh, put our two-year-old on the waiting list or whatever, and if we find something better, we'll, that, and exactly what they do, and she, everything, your whole presentation was right on, so uh, I agree with everything you said, so. So would this be every, would this be every year they have to reapply? No, if they have a fifth grader who wants to go to Lincoln Park, they would apply at the entry year only, sixth grade. Once they're in, they have that seat. They don't have to keep applying. Once they're in, right. I'm talking about the parent that fills out an application and then they, you know, their child doesn't get in that year. Yes. How do we deal with that? So they stay on the wait list for that year and then they reapply the next year. That's what I'm asking, mm -hmm. okay. Um, how many magnet schools do we presently have? We have six magnet schools, and then we have some schools with tractor programs, but that is different, so it's six magnet. Okay, and, and the attractive schools. So the magnets are FK Suite, Fairlawn, Sam Gaines, Cass, Westwood, and? LPA. LPA, okay. All right, so to put, you'd put the kids on the list the year before they are ready to go into these schools. Yes. Okay. All right, and if they don't make it that year, do they, there is no list, you have to reapply the next year? There's a list for that school year and then they have to apply the next year, yes. If they don't make it on that list. Right, so what that does is it keeps the list pure with people that we know want to go there rather than an old list and people have changed their mind. It makes okay. it faster for parents to know if they got a seat and rather than us having to keep checking with the next person. This is just for approval. Is there any other conversation on that? Mobility, mitigation, one year application per year. Helen, just give a quick. Okay. Yes, on that one, when parents select their school and if they move here, um, they're assigned to that school. Our controlled choice process stays open all year and they can change their minds multiple times. And some people do. So that so their children 
are moving multiple times throughout the school, and that leads to a lack of continuity and in instruction. Most districts, you, you get assigned to your school, and that is your school for the school year, unless you move. So that's what we're proposing, is that we just mirror that more common practice of assigning a family to the school. There's always going to be exceptions, and there are times when an administrative move has to be made, but we want people to stick with their school unless there's something you know, really mitigating that would make them move. Or they have moved to the other end of the county. Of course, we're going to move if they change zones. But we would just like to be clear that once you're in a school, that is your school for that school year to reduce mobility. Mr. Chair, this, this is one item here that I strongly support that we go with this. I know you've all had it. I know you all, we don't, can't talk about it, but I've had at least three, maybe four this year uh, problems with parents wanting to move their kids from the school for certain reasons or whatever. Recently, the one that I had last week, what I like about it though is when I get him, I just send him to him. <laughs> and he deals with it. This would be, I think, the third or fourth school, maybe. I think you know the one yeah, I'm talking about. Uh, and, and I. I don't know what you're going to do or how if it's been handled, but uh, I, I strongly support this because uh, just, and again, in your presentation, uh, I don't know who you were quoting, quoting about children. When this happens, the success rate goes down so low every time they move, and uh, uh, I'm, sure that I, I'm sure that that's true. But I strongly support this, and I think one application, I think that's more. I know up north, up north, some areas they won't even move it they won't even move your child well, straighten them out that's it he doesn't you know, this keep this is school, unique you know. to st lucie county uh <coughs> just the movement we're, we're having a real problem with transitions from school to school our mobility rate in the district is almost 30 percent that means oh, um parents are changing their minds on a whim and we're accommodating and it creates issues with transportation not just that it hurts the kid Kids don't, don't thrive in constant change. No. And we have to put things into place where they have stability. And, and sometimes we have to provide that stability for the families. And we do try in certain circumstances, as Dr. Wild said, to work with individual families sometimes if something's not working and we try to be accommodating. But I, I want to be able to fall back on that where you're assigned, that's your school. You know, that was your choice. You chose this. You got your choice. So there's, there's not all that transitory throughout the year that's hurting the kid and disrupting the schools as well because it is very unique to this district. I've never seen anything like it. So I just, I would like to get away from it. Um, yes, ma'am. I, I totally agree with that. Microphone, I just, please. I totally agree with that. I just wanna make sure that we have, um, we have those special cases. For example, if a child is being bullied, you know, and is miserable because they're being tortured, we have And we those, have processes in place where we have to provide if mm -hmm. a child has a, a right. by you law. know, yeah, by law. So there, those protections okay. are in place for families. Um, but when it comes to just the, the, the willy-nilly, I just didn't like this yeah. person today and I'm going to pull my kid out and send him here. That's not good for the kids. It's not providing stability, and we really need to put things in place where that doesn't happen. We got it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. So um, let's say that you are in a school, um, not necessarily by, it was your second choice. This was not your first choice. And you found out that your first choice came open midstream or at the beginning of the school year. Because I am in this school, not by my choice as well, not my first choice. Does that mean that I'm going to have to stay there for the whole year, or can I move over to the other school that was my first choice? Because uh, if if there's a if we open a wait list, mm -hmm. then you'd be invited. So per your example, you would be invited to move, and then you could move. But that would be because you were on a list that just opened up. Like say, for example, to cast, then you would be permitted to move because then you'd have that all the way through. If it was a waitlist situation. Okay. Yes. And a waitlisted situation wait is, a, is a magnet school, but are you talking about a regular school, let's say, um, Gen School, River's Edge and Parkway? And you wanted to go to Parkway, but you ended up at River's Edge? 
Actually, I hadn't gotten that far. I was just asking a question. Oh. So I was going to let her finish and then hear what she has to say. Because I thought you were talking about school choice. You thought wrong. I, I, I was just, I, was, I just wanted to hear what um, she had. So let, can you finish and then we'll go. Sure, for, for the magnets, if you were invited, like when, because you said you'd find out a seat was open in your school, that would be through invitation. So that would be a waitlist situation. If you got your second choice, I, th I don't know if you said second or seventh. Second. Seventh? Second choice. Se if you got your that second choice, choice right, if you got your second choice, you would be assigned to that school for that year, and you wouldn't be applying to go to a different school. That would be your choice for that year. You could apply the following year. Okay, so to, you answered. And that's to Troy's point, to Mr. Okay. Anderson's point. Yes. You, you and so therefore then, if I got in, I didn't get into my first choice, I got into my second choice, that I'm gonna stay in that school for that year. Okay, because I wouldn't know without calling the first choice that there was an opening in the first choice. Right. Because we so if I call the first choice and there's an opening, then what happened? Could you repeat if that? If I call the first choice and I found out that there was an opening there, eh, can I move based only, on mobility only mitigation? Only if it was during the controlled open enrollment period that is uh, by law, and that's a certain period of time in the year, and it probably wouldn't be likely if it was a first choice school because that sounds like a school that's constantly running full. But if it had seats, you could move through controlled open enrollment. But that's specific to certain sites. So I know that's a complicated answer, but no. if it was just two regular schools and mm -hmm. you got your second choice, that would be your, your school for the year. Okay, all right, thank you. But Mr. Chair, you would still have under this program you would still have one application per year and if there was a special situation that they deem a special situation but I, I'm just astounded here I uh, I didn't never heard it before a 30 percent mobility rate in our school system that that is totally unacceptable to have a problem child like the one I just talked about unleashed on the other students and the teachers that, and giving them special accessions constantly mm -hmm. with a 30% mobility rate, that this is a big burden on only the, uh, the good students, the students that are behaving themselves, and the teachers that are trying to keep with the program and they don't have to step back because somebody's got to catch up, that, that's a problem. So I, I, again, I strongly support it. I even strong more support it. So I can't tell, 30% mobility rate, that's got to come down. That's got to come down. We have a school that, um, I think it is Lake, Lakewood Park, that's yeah. very transient. Yes. Will that um, stabilize, stabilize that school any? Yes. How? I mean, why because, are they because, transient in the first because place? We're, because you started at the school and you contacted student assignment and off, wanted to know another choice um, throughout the school year, you won't be afforded that option. You're going to stay there. Okay. And sometimes at Lakewood Park, families move out of the area. It's not just because they're choosing another school. We also have a very transient population. Families move from place to place, and that, uh, that attributes to the issue as well with Lakewood Park. Well, that's, I, that's what I thought. You told me that they, it was for movement, that they actually moved. Um, but I wondered if there was another reason, like they just didn't like where they were, so they, they, they went to Lakewood so, Park. You want to answer that? I would say it is a combination. So this isn't going to eradicate all mobility. Uh, we're, we're talking about reducing it by removing that choice that people can make because they've had a bad day or uh, the bus ride was too long today or whatever the reason may be. Um, there's still going to be mobility caused by um, movement, as Dr. Prince said, and you see higher rates of mobility in rental communities if there's a large number of houses or apartments, you're going to see more mobility because people tend to move in and out. When there's home ownership, you see less. Um, so we're not by any stretch saying that we're going to erase mobility, but we do believe that our policy is lending itself to a 30% mobility rate, making it, exasperating it. Thank you. Consensus? Thumbs up. Sales tax 2024. 
Okay, so I, I went through briefly the sales tax. This, this I feel actually out of everything the most strongly about. Um, this just makes sense. 2024, we have a presidential election. You'll have a significant larger population of the, of the voters turn out for that. And um, I think right now, based on the polling that we have uh, conducted, which was pretty extensive, uh, the public feels like we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and overwhelmingly, they would support this in 2024. So I think now is the time to do it. It would, uh, I think, be a huge mistake if we waited until 2026 and had two uh, items on the ballot. I think it would be really, truly problematic, and we could lose out on both if we don't do what I'm suggesting that we do. There's been a lot of thought that went into this. I just, nobody wants to go through this. I, I mean, I, I lose sleep over stuff like this. But this is the time, it's the, it's the right time to do this right now. Do we have the authority to do that? Uh, yes. We do. Okay. Yep. When was the last sales tax um, on the ballot? 2006. Oh. 20 years. 20 years. Thumbs up for me. <laughs> we good? Okay. Okay. Good. Um, Mr. Ingersoll, we also have one item on the agenda that's a voting item. Sure. Which is the uh, National History Day competition student trip to College Park, Maryland. And we have uh, students and uh, chaperones going. And I um, recommend the board approve as submitted. You've heard the recommendation of the superintendent. Can I get a motion? So moved. Motion. I have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Did, did we just vote on an item? It was an emergency at, item. At, at a whip shop? Okay. I just wondered. I Advertised, <laughs> though. Whoa! <laughs> Mr. Kelly, your point was taken. Okay. Thank you for doing it so humbly. Can I, can I have the floor just for a second because there's some misconceptions getting off the bus today. I got some information unless you have something else. No, sir. I'd no. like to leave you all with this and I won't bring it up again. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about growth and about how many people are moving here and, and basically the reason why. And, uh, and it's all coming down south in Port St. Lucie, not up in the north. And there has to be a reason. Uh, why? Why are they doing that? Uh, first of all, uh, we approved 28,000 homes 20 years ago, southwest annexations. That, that figure, Marty, shake your head if I'm wrong. That figure, it's, it's about 32 to 33 now. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, eventually, it could be. Shake your head again. Eventually, there's enough there if they divided it the same way they're doing it now. It could possibly, that whole section could go to near 68, 70,000 homes. Yes, it could. It's not. It hasn't been approved, but it could be. And they're in the city. They're annexed in already. That's important to know. On top of that 33,000, all the other ones that you just drove through today, and I got it from the EDC, and I confirmed it with two other people, South of Midway Road, 60,000 homes have been approved. It's actually 62, isn't it? That's everything. Yes, okay, so that's a new figure that I don't know if anybody has. That's, that's what it is. I thought it was maybe 50,000, but it's over 60,000. Now, this is already approved. These are going to be built, okay? This is not what else can be built, like the 70,000 down in Southwest. That's, this is over the, I'm not gonna be around, you guys are gonna handle it, especially you. We're guys. gonna name Powerline Road the Jack yeah. Kelly Road. Well, That's my first recommendation. Yeah, no, please don't change that road. I don't like that road. Deb, they're mostly in Debbie's district, so it's her problem. But uh, the thing is, why, why uh, is everybody move? Is it because the New York Mets are in Port St. Lucie? Is it because we have a, we give everybody a free loaf of bread when they move here? We have a better school system. Yeah, we do. But that's we have the 
that's the whole county that's the number one school system. The reason, this is the reason and the only reason, up until about 2000, there were 82,000 homes here approved by GDC, that's all we had, and we were about half built out, okay. Uh, a lot of you people, you folks already know this, I'm just reminding you, I know, I know that you know this. There's a reason why they all came here. After 2000, uh, we had a heck of a time with our city council. We decided that 82,000 homes, GDC homes, one eighth acre lots with sewers and wells next to each other, some of them 25 feet from each other, was not a good thing. So the council decided that we would, we would do a ridiculous thing that nobody ever did before. We would make the entire city on water and sewer. We met the entire city, everything that we annex, everything, out to Range Line Road, everywhere. So without going on and, and belaboring the point, the entire city of Port St. Lucie, the second or third largest city in the state of Florida, the entire city is on city water and city sewer. So if Coulter comes in, if Matney Homes, anybody comes in and builds, they're gonna get water and sewer. This is a number one most important thing in the world, especially in the state of Florida. We're the only city of its size that has water and sewer available in the entire city, the whole city. And I forget, how many square miles are we now? 130, how many square miles? About 125 square miles. So you can imagine, there could be 800,000, a million people here, easy. Water and sewer. Just move here. So the most profitable and best department in the entire county you could figure out would be the utility department in the city of Port St. Lucie, where the new city manager just came from because of the success he had. Because we make the developers pay for the water and sewer. We have a problem with, with busing. We, we don't get half the money we have to, right? Be nice if the developers who keep asking about it paid for that, wouldn't it? Be nice. Uh, the mayor of Port St. Lucie, hats off to her. Uh, she's taken the mantle with the people don't pay enough impact fees. And I just, I'm just asking for the support of our, our, our people, everybody involved in, in, in the school system behind her because they don't pay what they should pay for impact fees. Uh, they need our support. They need everyone's support, the county commission, everyone. Growth doesn't pay for itself. I know I sound like, uh, like I did 20 years ago, but that's what the mirror of the city sounds like. Now and some people don't like it. They think that that goes against development. Well, if I'm gonna get development like that, it's only coming here because we have water and sewer available and they wanna put all these kids and everybody on our roads and in our school system, they have to pay for that. They are paying for the water and sewer hookup because it behooves them and it's a great sales point. So you can understand, they're all moving here because the city has water and sewer. Marty, do you disagree? No, sir, he knows. That is it and everyone that's associated with it, the county, they all know it. Port St. Lucie has city water and city sewer. They're gonna keep moving here, they're not gonna stop. Second part, and I'll be quiet, in 2004, 2005, <clears throat> after everybody found out, Tesoro and all the big ones found out this, this is what we had to offer, and they all started the annex and they offered 250 million, which got spent in one and a half years. All this money they were giving us, and they're gonna move here, and just everybody came from all over the country because city water, city sewer, okay. Because of that, in 2004 and 2005, we talked about this on the bus. We were talking to Chris, remember, Chris Vogel? He remembers. City of Port St. Lucie had between 650, over 700 applications for new houses, one family homes, every month, every single month. 18 months later, and this is the caveat in my caution, we're making plans here and I wanna keep that we keep making plans. 18 months later, Mrs. Richardson, 30 homes a month depression, whatever you want to call it. And it stayed like that for many years. And a lot of the original developers down there didn't build a house for 12 years, just as some people had said. So the thing is, there's gonna be more people here, I'm trying to tell you more than what we're planning. Eventually, 
But when, we don't know because that curve could any time. 700 to 30 in 18 months. So just a word of caution from the old guy. I don't think anybody's gonna argue with the figures I gave you. Marty's backing me up so I feel good. Because <laughs> he knows, and he knows that's the reason. Water and sewer, that's why they moved here. There's no other, it isn't the Mets. It's not the Mets. Thank you for the time, let me talk. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, it's been a great day. Thank you so much, it's me and Jern.